Hello, everybody, and welcome to Kick Conflict to the Curb, the place that growth-minded people come to learn how to feel confident using their voice during tough conversations without losing their cool. I'm your host, Joyce Weiss, communication and conflict resolution coach, and I work with human resource professionals. So their direct reports feel confident resolving issues and relationships at work. They transform from not knowing how to start a tough conversation and transform all the way to feeling confident using their voice and getting the respect that they deserve. They even get a better night's sleep. Today's guest is going to enlighten us on the difference in how men and women communicate and how to feel confident during conflict. I would like to introduce our special guest, Diane DeResta. Diane DeResta, CSP, is the founder and CEO of DeResta Communications Incorporated, a New York City consultancy serving business leaders who deliver high state presentations, whether one-on-one, -on -one, in front of a crowd, or from an electronic platform. Daresta is the author of Knockout Presentations, How to Deliver Your Message with Power, Punch, and Pizzazz, in an Amazon.com category bestseller and has spoken on four continents. Diane is past president of the New York City chapter of the National Speakers Association and former media trainer for the NBA and WNBA. She was featured on CNN and quoted in New York Times, Wall Street Journal, London Guardian, Investors Business Daily, and Bloomberg Radio. Diane is a certified speaking professional, a designation held by less than 12% of speakers nationwide, as well as a certified virtual presenter. Her blog, Knockout Presentations, made the top 50 public speaking blogs, and her LinkedIn course, Speaking Confidently, ranked number five on the top 20 most popular LinkedIn courses. And now we have Diane DeResta in the studio. Welcome, Diane. Thank you, Joyce. It's great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, we met um, just a couple of years ago because we both belong in a group called Video Rockstars. And uh, I've always listened to you, Diane, because you're always the first to raise your hand and ask questions. And I said, this lady is confident. So when I finally, when we yeah, started to nurture our relationship, I knew you had to be a guest. So thank you. You're very welcome. So I mentioned on social media and even in, in the introduction that you were going to enlighten us on how men and women communicate differently. Could you expound upon that, please? Yes. So one of the things that I do is I work with leaders to help and, and their teams to be more powerful communicators. So how do you show up powerfully so that you're confident, clear, and influential? And I, I have a special place in my heart for women, although I like my male clients as well. And I've noticed there are some challenges when people are speaking across culture, across gender. And so there are a few things that I've noticed. And one of the things is that men tend to get to the point. In other words, just give me the facts, whereas women want to tell the backstory. So when they're proposing something, they'll want to tell you everything that led up to it, and then they'll present their idea, and that then the men's eyes glaze over, and women can actually lose credibility that way. So best bet is to lead with the idea, like in other words, get to the point. So that's one of the things that is different. Uh, another thing is women tend to overthink, and I'm, I'm adding myself in this category, mm. whereas women, uh, men will tend to jump in a little more assertively or aggressively. <clears throat> and by the way, I am aware that there is a double standard. So this is the big challenge for women. Men can do certain things. They'll be called assertive. If a woman does it, she's, she's called aggressive. And 
I know this from personal experience, women complain about it to me. <clears throat> and so what we need to do is to show up powerfully, not take that personally, but know how to finesse a situation. So for example, I was working with a woman who was now a CEO of a spin-off company. And I was talking about how she needs to show up differently because she was talking to the board and the chairman of the board. And she said to me, you know, Diane, I see these guys at the table they are sitting back like this, but I can't do this. And I said, you're right, you can't. So observe, don't deny the reality, mm -hmm. but work with it. Know that you have to show up a little smarter, a little bit better sometimes to get that credibility. So sometimes it's harder for women to be heard. And one of the and things that's, that's, I just want to, before I forget, this is right now, there may be some viewers saying, come on, that's not me. And lucky if that isn't you, if it is you though, some of the strategies that you're, or the differences that you're discussing right now, Diane, are imperative because we need to know that we need to show up and let's say you're very aggressive and you're known like that, then it depends on who you're communicating with, mm -hmm. if it's a male or even female, um, that you may need to tone it down. So this That's is right. good stuff. So go on, you were gonna say something. So you know, speaking of toning it down, another thing is women tend to be more expressive <laughs> and we get called emotional when it's really passion a man will be showing passion a woman would be called emotional but i was working with a woman and she was very effusive she had she was loved she was a rock star she her team loved her but that effusive style that she had that expressive style did not play well in the boardroom mm -hmm. so she had to learn how to show up differently and so when we talk about coaching sometimes people think oh that's remedial it means i'm not doing well no not necessarily because as you get to the next level it requires a different set of skills, a different demeanor. And so we need to show up differently, <clears throat> still being you, still being authentic. So she had to learn how to take a seat at the table, how not to be so effusive. So for example, mm -hmm. I would say to her, definitely smile and say hello in the beginning. And then that's it. Don't smile throughout because you won't be taken seriously. So again, it depends, as you said, on the context choice, on the situation, but it's really about reading the room, knowing the culture, and then acting accordingly, playing the game, so to speak. And reading the room, this is what coaching really helps with, because I know I've taken several courses just on body language. I have a friend and colleague called Jeanette Gadotti, and she's brilliant on teaching body language. And we have to read the room. If if you're seeing men or women rolling their eyes or looking at their watch instead of taking it personal like you just said figure out hmm what do i need to do right now to exactly how myself or you know relax or whatever the situation is so yeah the mistake people make is let's say they have a powerpoint presentation and people mm -hmm. are drumming their fingers and rolling their eyes they keep going because that's what they planned and instead read the room and stop and ask a question. Yes. How is this going so far? What, what's important for you to know? And they may say, skip that. I wanna know what's coming up next. So skip the pages and go to where they need to go. That takes confidence, but oh, absolutely. That, that's how you avoid a conflict by reading the room and having the confidence to stop what you're doing and make a change and ask, don't guess, ask people, what would make this valuable? What's important to you right now? Should I continue or would you like me to skip ahead? And they'll tell you. And then you're, you're in partnership with people. You're taking the elephant out of the room by asking that important, confident question. How would you like me to proceed? What's more important to you? Mm -hmm. And then we need to be flexible. And that gets you you're, you're right into the next flow of this conversation is how to become confident during conflict well it's not easy especially if you're mm -hmm. like me i don't like conflict there's some people like you you know who are you're ready for it and this is what you specialize in but 
you can't avoid it because it just festers. So part of confidence has to do with mindset and skill set. So when I work with people on any level, we're first getting your mindset. What are you believing? Because those limiting beliefs can prevent you from moving forward and being effective. And the second thing is the skill set, because there is a skill to conflict resolution. I was a mediator in my community for a, a number of years, and they gave us really good training. And one of the best ways to mediate a conflict is to have a third party, an objective third party. But what would happen is they had certain rules. So they would explain what was expected. So the first thing in a conflict is talk about the expectations of how you'd like to work with the person. And then they would say, there's no crosstalk. So one person speaks and the other takes notes and then vice versa. And then they get to talk to each other with the help of the mediator. So it's knowing the skills and part of it is asking questions. Mm -hmm. So instead of the knee jerk defending your position, which is what we normally do, it's be curious. I'm curious. Uh, tell me more. Well, how did you arrive at that? Well, no, I wasn't thinking that at all. What did I do to give that impression? Have a curious mind and ask questions. Oh, this is a, this is a coach. Cause that's, that's my favorite mm -hmm. question to help my clients with Diane. I'm curious. That is just so that just relaxes the other person. It does. You're not being you're not pushing. You're not judging. I'm curious. Is there anything that I just said? It, it just seems like there's more discomfort. Or I'm curious, you know, what makes you say that? Or whatever it is. It just, it relaxes you because you can think of what you're going to say and it relaxes the other person. Do you see it that way or do you see it a different I do, way? I do. Okay. And um, part of it is language as well. Because I remember one time <clears throat> my husband was having trouble pulling a blind down. And so in my nicest tone, I said, oh, no, you have to do it this way. And he said, I don't have to do anything. And I thought, whoa. Where's that coming from? And then as I reflected, because that's part of your conflict resolution, you take responsibility and you reflect. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, I did say you have to. And he doesn't like being told what to do. And that's how mm -hmm. he heard that. Even though my tone was gentle, he mm -hmm. heard the words, you have to. So, you know, if I take responsibility, I could have said, mm -hmm. oh, what, what works is you pull it that way. Mm -hmm. so oh. Sometimes it's the language. But the good news is, is viewers, did you see what Diane did? She went back and she said on reflection, and that's how we learn. So the next time, even your tone of voice was good, Diane, it's those words that were just triggers to your husband. Well, that here's I the thing. When I work with people on their executive presence, what mm -hmm. I've learned in my observations and working with people is people who have executive presence have one thing in common for sure. They are 100% aligned in their visual, vocal, and verbal communication. So in that case, my tone was good, but my words were not. Yes. And again, it's not even what I think, it's what the person thinks. So I, I, I had a colleague one time and she used to use this phrase and it used to annoy the hell out of, excuse me, it used to annoy the heck okay. out of me and the heck out of my colleague. And she'd say, my goal for you is, it's like, I don't need you to set a goal for oh. me, you know? Yeah. But it used to anger us because it was aggressive. We felt it was aggressive. So language is important. So a lot of times we may think the other person is picky, sensitive, or what's the problem, but mm -hmm. we need to tune into our language as well because that can set someone off. Oh, absolutely. And understanding the triggers that we may give to other people and not being rigid. This is, this mm -hmm. is all important. Now, you, you touched upon something that I want to go to next, which is the mindset that we have. Um, what self-limiting beliefs do we sometimes hold so we within our mind so we don't feel confident? How we can change that, oh, I can't really say that, to your confidence that you work with with your clients. Well, that's something I work on in the beginning because you're not going to be effective as a communicator if you have the wrong thought pattern. So we try to flesh out, what are you believing about this? Well, I don't know enough. Or in terms of conflict, oh, they're just going to blow up anyway. Oh, you know, there's there's no sense in doing it because they're, they're thick. So if you go in with that mindset, that's exactly what you're going to experience and or you're going to avoid it 
from the beginning. So the first thing is change your mindset. And if it's too much of a jump to go from this person is difficult to this person is easy to talk to, then just say, this person is willing to listen, put something in between there. But the other thing is when you are working with limiting beliefs, start writing down the beliefs and then write down the skills. So pre-plan what you're going to do. And in, in conflict resolution, there are some templates. One of them is called DESC, and D-E-S-C. And what it is is a template for describe the behavior uh, explain the emotions, D-E-S, uh, what are the, I forgot the S one, and so what are the consequences? S was, mm -hmm. I forgot, but it'll That's come okay. to me. So what happens is when you have that template, you can take a pause before you go in and talk to them and fill it out. And oh. then, then you have a way of approaching instead of just talking off the top of your head. Beautiful. Oh, S is specific. Oh. Yes, okay. Of course you were going to figure, isn't it? The mind is wonderful. <laughs> I knew you were going to figure out that S. So just to take from where what you just said about the, the desk is that another portion of that, I'm curious what you think of that. Uh, let's say you make a list of all the negative limiting beliefs. Then next to it, you, you say a positive, not Pollyanna, but no one's going to hear me or no one's going to listen to me. That's your negative. Hey, when I use my voice, I'm going to get the attention that I deserve. I don't have the right kind of education versus the experience that I have will really help in this conversation. What yes. do you think of that kind of thing? Perfect. Oh. That's exactly what I do with people. Okay. You find out what you have to work with and, yes. and you, you write that down and you embrace it instead of negate it. And that's what people do when they have limiting beliefs. So yes. whenever I'm working on someone's presentation, especially it's what are you believing? Let's change the belief. Perfect. Let's write it out and now go in with that mindset. Beautiful. I mean, within these 20 minutes, we've gotten a lot of good strategies. Now I've got to take you back in time, Diane. What would you tell your 18-year-old self? What advice would you give her? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, 18. Go uh, don't don't take yourself so seriously. It'll all work out. Don't worry so much. I, I think that's what I would say. And how does this? Oh, I I love that. I mean, it's yours. Whether I love it or not doesn't matter. That's what you would tell your 18-year-old self. And how? was the transformation from you probably thinking that way as you were younger to how you are now how how did you go from there i'm trying to do my transitions but hey bring it up to the camera girl. Oh, yeah. it takes a long time and it's still a work in progress <laughs> i would put put it that way that yes. uh you know it, it all works out in the end so you just put one foot in front of you you set your goals and, and the other thing is always get support so if you have good people around you, it makes life easier. It helps you to get where you're going and to achieve your goals. Nobody does it alone. I think that's the main message I would give myself because I was a loner thinking I had to do everything by myself, pull myself up by the bootstraps. And that, that doesn't work very well. So today I have great support, great networks, and I can call on people when I need help or I will hire coaches. That That's another thing. I would love to see coaches for younger people. Mm -hmm. You know, we get coaches when we're entrepreneurs, so we're very much hiring coaches. Or if you're in a company and you're in a leadership role, you can get a coach. I think that we need coaches at a younger age. Some people who are in sports, they have their coaches, their sports coaches, and they learn mm -hmm. a lot of life lessons. But if you didn't play a sport, I don't know that you get that so much. So I think that would be a, a lesson or a message for my 18-year-old self. Don't do it alone. Don't do it alone. Get the support that you need. And coaching is, I so agree with you. So many times people think, oh, let's see, I've got to be at the top of my career in order to get a coach. Well, that is part because then you can get better and get to the next rung and get to the next rung or learn to relax, whatever your situation is. But the 18-year-old, my God, especially now, Diane, 
with all the self-doubt, with all the fear that's going on, young adults need coaching, counseling, whatever you want to call it. You know, it's more so. I just wrote a post on LinkedIn and I was telling a story about a class that I started in my community for seventh grade girls. Mm -hmm. And it came at the request of a parent who I didn't know. And I said, listen, I work with executives. I don't work with children. Oh, no, no, no. I can't get anybody. So finally, I said to her, okay, if you can get 10 girls together, I'll do it. Within a week, she had them. So we started working on public speaking confidence Mm -hmm. over eight weeks. Long story short, I ended up doing three of these groups because one mother had three daughters and they want, she wanted it for each of them and the, when they were in seventh grade. So now I've stayed in touch sporadically. The oldest girl of the first class is now working for a financial services company in New York. And she said, can I give them your name? They're going to do some kind of offsite in the summer. Long story short, I'm going to be speaking to this group. And she wow. today says that was the best training she ever got. And she shares my information with her interns. So yeah, she was one of the lucky ones that they, she, that those three groups of young girls got that kind of coaching at an early age. Yes. And, and how fulfilling for you. Because this is, this is, you know, my, what a testimonial. And matter of fact, you, 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 you seem to be sliding right into where I want to ask questions, Diane. How do you do that? You know, exactly the segue from where we just ended. Now I'm going to go into, you, you already talked about, you know, how you help this group. So tell our viewers, how can they get a hold of you? Um, I mean, I, I have your YouTube up there, your website, mm-hmm. author of Knockout Presentations, How can they get a hold of you and what can you do for them? All right. So go to Duresta.com on the bottom of the homepage. There is a free one sheet of everything you need to know for speaking, like a checklist. So if you're about to speak or present, you don't have to go through, well, what do I need? It's right there for you to look at this one page checklist. It's a PDF. So feel free to, it's a free download. And there's also a monthly easing that has videos and tips and articles as well. And you can send me an email either through my website or you can connect on LinkedIn with me. Oh, this is great. Thank you. And getting that PDF, you know, I'm going to go and get that myself right when we get off. And tell us about Knockout Presentations since it's oh, there just you know, right on the, the board. It's, it's in its third edition. I'm very proud Ooh. of the book. It was I wrote it like a seminar in a book so that if you couldn't hire me as a speaker, trainer, coach, you could. It was the next best thing to having me there. So each chapter has do's and don'ts and checklists at the end. I have templates in there, examples. It's there's no fluff. It's really practical tools, which is my brand, practical tips you can use immediately. And it's been used as a college textbook and it's been read in the C-suite. So it's after all these years, it's still selling and right. it's a great tool. God, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm gonna get that one too. Watch your numbers go up. Well, <laughs> Diane, my last question. Drum roll. Will you come back, please? Definitely. Thank you. Yay, good. Nice Well, this was a wonderful conversation with Diane DiResta, author of Knockout Presentations, CEO of DiResta Communications Incorporated, and you will come back. And I I thank you so much. You were a wonderful special guest. Thank you. And I just want to invite people to subscribe to my YouTube channel because there are over 100 videos on there. Great. I'll go there too. Good. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, Joyce. So thank you for watching Kick Conflict to the Curb. I will have many more thought-provoking leaders such as Diane DeResta. And I'm going to end the broadcast with an expression that I use almost every time that I end a video. Remember, you get what you tolerate. Thanks so much for watching.